Hi, Suzanne from Flat Wearable Artists and Jewelry. In this video tutorial, I am going to show you how to make a new style of hinged bracelet. And it is using a small portion of coil, which is actually throttle cable. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to show you how we're going to make that. And we're going to use these pieces of silverware here. All right, the first thing that we need to determine is the uh, measuring on the bracelet. This bracelet is going to fit an eight inch wrist. We're gonna make an eight inch bracelet. We need to ha add one half of an inch to give extra room for the bracelet. You don't want a bracelet that's going to be completely tight to the customer's wrist. You wanna have some room there. So we're gonna make this bracelet eight and a half inches. We're going to subtract one inch for the length of the coil spring. Therefore, we're going to need to cut our pieces to give us a total length of seven and a half inches. We divide that by two because we're using two pieces of silverware. So that lets us know that each of our pieces of silverware needs to be 3.75 inches long or three and a quarter inches long. So I've gone ahead and I've marked three and a quarter inches long, and that is the solid black line here. I've marked back one quarter of an inch, and that is where we're going to um, start our pin. That's where we're gonna create our pin length from, because we want a pin length of one quarter inches. So what I did is I went ahead and I cut the coil. Now, this is what the coil looks like. It comes rolled up in a package. It's actually a control cable or throttle cable. You can advance to auto and auto zone. I've uh, put the link up, link up for uh, both of those places. So this is the coil here. Um, I've done some of the grinding on the end. You need to grind and sand that smooth so there's no sharp edges. Using my mini grinder here, um, we're going to finish that. So I've gone in and done it flat. Let me turn this a little bit here. I've gone in flat to clear off that edge there. Now I'm going to just give a little bit of a taper around the edge. Kind of a little bit of a bevel there. Same on the opposite side. and then finish that up on the fiber wheel. Make sure you're always using eye protection when you use power tools. And that will make that nice and smooth. Make sure you feel for any sharp spots because if you feel any sharp spots now, your customer's gonna feel that later on. We're going to go over to the drill press and I'm going to show you how we're going to open up the tip of this coil a little bit. And this is the coil here. We're going to open that up a little bit. It may look a little bit bigger in video, um, but it's actually very, very tiny. And we're going to use a um, counter sinking bit um, or what's called a center drill. And we're going to open that up just a slight bit because we're going to taper our pegs slightly so it's a little bit wider at the base you'll have less chance of breaking the peg off if you keep it a little bit wider at the base okay i'm here at the drill press and what i've done is i've clamped in the coil into a vise here and you don't want to try and do this without having it clamped in. I'm using the center drill. Uh, we carry those on our, our website. So what I'm doing here is the center drill starts out with a very tiny portion. Let me get a little bit closer for you to see. Starts out with a very, uh, very tiny portion here. Then it starts tapering up until it becomes a full width. We're not going to go to the full width. We're only going to use up into the tapered portion there. And what that's gonna do is give us a little bit wider of an opening, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and do both sides. You 
don't want to go all the way down or you're going to end up busting through the coil. Okay. So can you see how we've now got a beveled interior there? Let me flip that around. Let me show you the difference here from where it was done. Okay, you can see where it's been done and where it has yet to be done. I'm going to clamp that in. We'll do the opposite side. Uh, this is a little pomegranate vise I've had for years. Uh, Harbor Freight sells a, a little bench vise as well. Okay. If you find after drilling you have any sharp edges, you want to make sure you go back and take care of that. And I do have a little bit of one right there. I'm sure you can see right on the tip. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, clean that off and then we're going to proceed from there. So I uh, just want to back up for a second. I used uh, a bolt cutter to cut the uh, coil there. It's uh, stainless steel. You don't want to use a bandsaw for that. So the bolt cutter works really well. We want to put a little bit of a curve in that. Not much. If you're crushing the coil, you're giving it too much of a curve. So just a little bit of a curve. I find that it works really well on the bender press. I really wasn't successful in giving it any curve by just trying to bend it by hand. Okay, if we need to come back in and do any adjustment on that, we can, but really that's enough curve. And we're going to go ahead and move to the silverware portion. So I'm going to now cut my silverware. Let me bring this back. I'm going to cut my silverware with the bolt cutter. This is the same bolt cutter that I used to cut the coil. I'm going to cut on my heavy line there. This is some really heavy silverware. That's the first one. Now, I would recommend that you make your peg when your silverware is flat and do your bending afterwards. I find it's a lot easier to make the pegs when the silverware is flat. So, if it helps you to mark out what area you're going to cut off, go ahead and do that. So anything in black is going to be removed. Bring that up so you can see that better. Okay, anything in black is going to be removed. And same thing here. Now I'm going to use my mini bandsaw to remove the unnecessary portions of the silverware. You can use a jeweler saw. You can also use a Dremel cutoff wheel, uh, whatever you find the easiest to use. I'm a power tool fanatic, so power tools it always is. Let's go over to the mini bandsaw. All right, we're here at the mini bandsaw and I'm gonna go ahead and remove the black area there. What I'm going to do is go down each side, then I'm gonna come in at an angle and create a little shoulder on either side there.
Okay, so that is the rough cut on creating the pegs. Now the reason I came in at an angle here, let me turn that so you can see what I'm talking about. I didn't come straight down, I came in at an angle. I believe it makes for a more pleasing looking uh, finished product. So we're gonna go and we're gonna do the filing on these areas. Okay, there's, uh, there's so many different ways that you can uh, remove the excess material to turn this into a proper sized peg to fit into the hole here. Um, filing is just my option. You can use a vertical belt sander. You can use some tips on a Dremel. I'm also going to be employing the use of a sanding drum on a rotary tool there. So these are um, half round files. These are number two half round files. Files come in so many different shapes and sizes and um, abrasivenesses. I don't even know if that's a word, but anyhow, so I'm just gonna go ahead. Files only work in one direction. So it works on the forward motion. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start fine tuning the cutting that we did on the mini bandsaw. I'm going to go ahead and I'll get this focused in a little bit closer for you. You want to make sure the peg is round all the way around so you have to go all the way around you can't just file on one side or the it's not going to be even you don't want to get the base of your peg too narrow or you run the risk of it breaking off I've got some cleanup work to do here. So I'm just going to go ahead and file. I'm going to fast forward through this filing portion of the video. And then I'll talk about it on the way out. All right, I have done most of the filing here. And you wanna keep test fitting as you go because you don't wanna take off too much. You need it to be a snug fit. If the fit is too loose, you're not gonna be able to get the solder. The solder is not going to attach both pieces if it's wiggling around in there. So when you get just about a perfect fit, do a little bit of fine tuning uh, with a sanding disc on my Dremel here. Okay, so hopefully you can see that the peg is a little bit wider at the base than it is at the tip. And that is going to fit in too the little bit of a tapered uh, hole we created there with the coil spring. So I've got a nice tight fit there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and file the other one. All right, so I have the filing done and have created the pegs here. And as I mentioned, just go through and make sure you're test fitting every so often. All right, so everything fits really nice and tight. You can see it fits tight because it's not coming apart. So now we're gonna go and we're gonna bend these handles into the proper shape. Okay, so we're going to bend these pieces. You have to be very careful to not put any stress or pressure on that peg there or it will snap off. 
So I'm using the largest roller and I'm gonna bend this just like I would bend any other bracelet. This is a really heavy piece, so it requires quite a bit of oomph to get it bent. So you're gonna bend just like you're gonna bend any other piece of silverware. The trickier part is because you don't have a spoon bowl or fork tines to help push it in, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage. You might want to use something to help push it in, like grab one of your other rollers, for example, to push up against the pin to help guide it in if necessary. And you can see I'm making sure that pin does not fall down into that channel or even on the edge of the channel. The only thing that's on the edge is that piece of silverware, the heavy piece of silverware itself. The peg it is not in the channel at all. So this um, bracelet does take a little bit more fuss work to create because you really have to line things up really well to start with. So I'm going to stop with that one. I'm going to go on to this next one. This is some really, really heavy silverware. Some of the heaviest silver plate I've worked with. Beautiful pattern. Okay, again, that peg is under no tension whatsoever. You have to be very, very careful. See where we are here. All right. We're going to have to turn these bottom edges up a little bit. So this here is just a little bit more of a matter of fussy work to get these just right. So let's see what we have so far. I may need to put more bend in my spring. I may need to put more bend in my silverware. I may need to put less bend in my silverware. Okay, I'm going to need to put more bend. So I want to get a little more bend going there, but I don't want a whole lot. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to go down and work on the rubber block. So I only need a little bit of a bend. Because I, what I need to do is to get this bottom piece to curve into a, a little bit more. I'll give it a little push by hand. I think that top's going to need to come up a little bit too. And uh, we're getting there. put it together, take a look at it, see where it needs adjusting. Just think of the spring as an extension of the silverware itself. So the spring may need a little more curve. So I think what I'm gonna do is give the spring a little bit more curve and I'm also gonna open this top curve up a little bit so it comes up more like this instead of more down. So I'm going to do that by just opening it up on my anvil real quick. And just continue to test fit. Okay, you can see that I brought that up a little bit. Let's bring the other one up a little bit. where we are here. I think I want to bend a little bit more at the bottom too. This is where you're going to get into a little more of your fussy work. 
Try to bend this up a little bit more. Let's put a little bit more bend into the coil itself. Again, if you're crushing the coil, you're pressing much too hard. Okay, you can see we're getting, we're just about getting there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open these top ones up a little bit further. And that should about do it. All right, so I continue to fuss with that a little bit. I opened these top ones up so they went up further. I'm exaggerating it, but so they, the tops went up further. And I also, down here at the bottom, where the peg is, I put my nylon pliers right there between where the peg and the end of the silverware came together and I gave that just a little bit of a turn up. Do not put full pressure on that peg or like I said, you're gonna snap that off. And I believe we need probably just a little bit more tweaking after soldering, but uh, I think we look pretty good there. So you wanna get this all cleaned up. Um, the coil has a little bit of grease, oil, dirt on it. You wanna make sure that it's all really super clean. Solder does not stick to dirty surfaces. And I'm going to get these pieces all cleaned and shined up. They're going to be cleaned up again afterwards because they're going to have a little bit of discoloration from soldering. But they have to be cleaned up first because you cannot have any dirt, oil, tarnish, um, any sort of residue on there. So I'm going to get these cleaned up, then we're going to move over to soldering. Okay, we're up to our soldering portion. So everything has been cleaned with Dawn dish soap, the blue uh, kind, which is uh, very highly detergent. So it's gonna clean off the dirt and oil and the grease and all that. So you wanna make sure when you put everything together, let me just back up a moment. Excuse my uh, messy bench. They say creative people are very messy. Well, I must be the most creative person on earth because I always have a messy bench. And so you want to make sure when you put this together, the way you put it together is the way it's going to be. So if you've got your coil crooked at all, like if you put it on and it looks crooked, it's going to be crooked when it's done. So you want to look at it from all angles. Make sure it's straight all the way around okay now make sure those are in there really nice and tight and I like to use nickels as props so I'm gonna set uh, all of that on to the nickels you can see a little bit of a gap there but we can adjust that afterwards just want to make sure we have everything correct. So once you've soldered, you're done. Not that you can't take it apart again, but you know, why do why take it apart if you don't have to? If you get it right the first time, I'm just twisting that around to make sure I have it on there really nice and tight. If you don't have to do something twice, then you know, don't do it twice. All right, I'm setting it up. This is a rotating solderite board. I love this. I use it a lot. Okay, everything. Check it from all angles. Make sure everything is lined up properly. Like I said, we'll touch up that gap afterwards. Because this coil is stainless steel, it requires a special flux. 
You cannot use just any flux with stainless steel. And we do carry this flux on our website. Just make sure that is in there really nice and tight. And always bring that together. I'll show you about adjusting um, your coil spring afterwards because even though it may look like it's sprung, the customer may open it and, and do what we used to call springing it open. It's not sprung open permanently. So I'm putting a couple of drops at my solder join of the liquid flux. You can find that on our website. I am using the low melt temp rosin core wire solder. And rosin core means it has flux inside the core. The flux um, is incidental for this uh, application because we are already using flux, but it does not interfere with what we're doing here either. So there's a couple of ways that you can handle the soldering on here. Let me grab some snips, some flush cutters. You can take a piece of the wire solder and I always say this, a little solder goes a long way. You can take a little piece of the solder and I'll show you here in a second. You just find a tweezer. Sorry, messy person. Okay. What I did is I, I took a little piece of solder. I'm gonna I'm gonna get in nice and close for you guys here. Took a little piece of this wire solder and I created like a U shape. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set that over my area to be soldered. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing on the opposite side. I'm just going to take a little snip of the wire solder. It's kind of my little rule that I say whatever amount of solder you think you need, you need probably half of that. So I've got another little U-shaped piece. I'm going to put that over the area to be joined. Now I'm going to keep my solder wire handy because I may feed in a little bit more when this solder melts. I may feed in a little bit more. Well, having a little trouble getting this on here. don't have the steadiest hands and I try not to disturb what I've got set up here and still get that on there. That's on there just fell over the back. Oh, fell off again. Prop my hand on there. Okay, there we go. Here it is. Now, we're also going to put on a product called Pool Gel. It's a heat barrier gel, and it's going to serve two purposes. It's this right here. We have this on our website as well. Pool Gel. And it's going to serve two purposes. One is it's going to protect the spring from heat. And the reason we do that is because that spring has been tempered. And if it gets too much heat, it loses the temper and that will cause it not to be springy anymore. All right, I'm gonna put it all on the areas that are not going to be soldered. So you don't wanna get it right up in the join area. Let me get something, let me get a solder pick here. You do not wanna get any cool gel in this area here. All right, so this serves two purposes. One is it protect, protects the temper and the other is solder will not flow where the cool gel is. So if you do use too much solder by accident, the solder can only flow up into here. It cannot flow into the rest of the coil. If you get too much solder in the coil, you're not gonna be able to flex the coil. So I'm going to keep my 
extra solder wire handy. And I am going to possibly feed some more in there. So let me back up a sec and show you what I'm doing, then we'll go back in. I've got my little torch here. I've got my extra solder wire torch in my left, solder wire in my dominant hand. I'm going to go back in. We're going to work on one side at a time. A little melt temp solder. It melts very quickly, 400 degrees, 450 degrees or so. You can see it already melted. I'm going to feed just a little bit more in there just to make sure I have enough. That was it. Okay. Very, very fast, very, very easy. I'm going to go to this side. I'm feeding the area to be joined. You do not need to heat the entire piece because the solder melts at such a low temperature. It doesn't require heat on the whole piece. Okay, you saw I fed in some more solder as I went. That's it. That's all the solder you need. Very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Very important that you do not disturb this until it is cool. <clears throat> Low melt temp solder. <clears throat> Excuse me. Low melt temp solder because it melts at such a low temperature and you have raised the temperature of the metal so much, it's gonna take a little bit of time for the metal to cool down below the melt temperature to solidify that solder. If you move it before that has occurred, you're going to ruin the solder joint. So I've got that sitting there and I'm gonna let it continue to sit there. You can spray it with some cool water if you want to um, speed up the process, but I'm gonna let that sit there. Then we'll come back and take a look at the solder joint. Okay, so everything's cooled off. I dunked that in some cool water just to make sure everything is cool. And let's take a look at the solder joint here. You can see I've only got solder Right, you can see where it's shinier there. That's where the solder is right there. Everything's sturdy and needs to be cleaned up. Again, solder just in that area there. All right, that's a nice clean solder joint that's going to require very minimal cleanup. Okay, flexes just fine. So I'm gonna show you um, what I do to clean up all of that mess there and get this ready for its uh, final shaping and final polishing. All right, so on one of my rotary tools, I have a, an abrasive Dremel. This is an actual um, Dremel wheel on a, on a quick change um, bit holder. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to clean up any of the discoloration, the dirt. You don't raise the temperature very high. You don't raise it high enough to create fire steel. So all it is is just a little bit of discoloration. And you can see that that cleans up really well. Clean up all the way around, including the inside. I always kind of like a little bit of a brush finish on the inside of my hinged bracelet. So I go inside and clean that up. I did it previous to soldering, so it's just touching it up right now. I guess I just like the contrast between a brushed interior and a shiny exterior. Okay, make sure all of the gunk is out of the hinge itself. And then we're going to go over to my bucking wheel and we're going to finish the polish. We're going to finish the polish on that. Um, we're also going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, is open that up a little bit, make that a little more round than oval. 
because I think it's just a little bit too elongated. All right, so I've gone ahead and shaped that to the proper shape. It's really just a matter of getting in there and tweaking it to getting it the right shape. And now that these areas here have been soldered, they're much stronger. So don't feel too afraid to go in there with some nylon pliers and give that a bit of a turn if you need to right in that area. Don't get overboard. As long as you've made your pins properly and you're not too aggressive with your bending, uh, with the uh, nylon pliers, you should not have any problem. So I've given it a final polish here on the bench buffer and uh, make sure that you polish that coil up too. Because it's stainless steel, it really shines up nicely. If at a show you have a customer who comes up and they stretch that bracelet too far open and now you have a big gap in there, um, one of the nice things about this material here is it's very strong and very resilient. If you bend it back in either direction, it'll close right back up again. I'm gonna make sure it's lined up and it snaps right back closed again. This here is a really, really heavy, heavy pattern and it's absolutely gorgeous. So if you have any questions, be sure to post them and I'll be happy to answer them. We'll talk to you again soon.